Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at the auto cycle and we're going to be making a pretty major simplification by saying that all of our specific heats are constant. So what that means is that as our temperature changes, we're going to ignore the fact that our specific heats should change. And instead, we're just going to use a single value every time that a CV or CP pops up. Now, the auto cycle is meant to simulate a piston. So before we begin, let's look at what a piston cycle looks like on a PV diagram. Now our starting point, which we're gonna call state one, is going to be right before we compress. So we've already mixed together our fuel and air, and so our piston is full of that mixture which is ready to combust. And so we are going to compress it up to a point. And then in the auto cycle, we have a spark ignition. So that ignition occurs. And then after ignition, we have a sharp rise in pressure, which eventually leads to the power stroke. So with that increased pressure, we push back even harder on our piston. And then we eventually start losing that pressure as we expand. And then we open up a valve and we push out all of the combustion products with the burnt fuel and eventually come back down, cross our starting point and have another stroke, which we call the exhaust stroke. And that pushes the rest of those combustion products out. And then we intake some clean air. And then finally we start back at the beginning. So looking at all these pieces, this first part is what we call the compression stroke. And this is where we are doing work on our system. So we are adding energy to our fluid. At the end of the compression stroke, we have ignition. And so ignition heats up the fluid and causes a sharp increase in pressure. Then after ignition, we have what we call the power stroke. So the power stroke is where we're getting a lot of the energy back out of the fluid as it pushes that piston and expands. At the end of the power stroke, like I said, the exhaust valve opens and we start exhausting all of our spent fuel. And so this piece here is the exhaust stroke. And then finally, we finish up with the intake stroke where we, repl where we replenish our air and get more oxygen in. Now, like I said, this first state here, we're calling state one, uh, in between the compression and ignition. So right as that ignition starts, we're gonna call that state two. And then this is a little bit arbitrary, but at the top of this curve, we're gonna call this state three because ignition isn't truly instantaneous. Uh, it continues even after we kind of enter this power stroke, but most of it happens in between state two and three here. And then once we start exhausting all of our combustion products, we call that state four. So that's roughly where the exhaust valve opens. Then down here, we're actually going to just ignore the exhaust and intake strokes. Technically, they do require a little bit of extra work for us. So there's some inefficiencies happening because of those extra strokes, but we're just going to neglect that for this analysis. Now, this is not a clean thing to work with. It's essentially impossible to do this analysis with pencil and paper. You'd have to do some sort of CFD analysis to figure out exactly what was going on. So we need to make some simplifications. So we're going to redraw this PV diagram, but with some important assumptions. First off, we're gonna completely take off this exhaust and intake stroke. And so we're just gonna have state one here and nothing below it. Then we're gonna say that the compression process between state one and state two is adiabatic. And adiabatic compression, of course, means that there is no heat transfer along this stroke, which is actually a pretty good assumption. Our next assumption is that this ignition process between state two and state three is going to be constant volume. And so this process is going to be just constant volume heating. So, from three to four, 
we're again going to assume that this is adiabatic. And then finally, from 4 to 1, we're going to assume that this is constant volume cooling, which is completely neglecting this exhaust and intake stroke. So this is not a perfect representation of a piston in the auto cycle. But these are processes that we know how to analyze. And so we'll be able to draw some conclusions and get some rough estimates of what's going on in the true cycle. So to start off, let's look at some of the key parameters that help define this cycle. First off, we're going to have the compression ratio, which we're going to call R. And this is just going to be equal to V1 over V2. So V1 is our maximum volume, and V2 is our minimum volume. And V1 is also V4, and V2 is also V3. So that'll come in handy later. So with just this ratio, we do a really good job of describing how far we're actually compressing our fluid. Another key parameter is the amount of heat added, Qn. So this is the heat transfer between states 2 and 3 during that process. And this is just the heat added by combustion. And this is important because the amount of work that we get divided by this Qn is going to tell us how efficient our engine is. So that Qn is a really key term. Another important parameter is that third temperature. So this T3 value is the maximum temperature in our cycle. And this is really valuable because it helps us determine what types of materials we need in order to keep this process going long term. Okay, now we actually get to move on to the analysis. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at our four processes. And for each of the processes, we're going to determine our delta U, our Q, and our W. And we're going to do all of these per unit mass just because that makes our life a little bit easier. So we have four processes, the compression from one to two, the heating from two to three, the expansion from three to four, and then finally the cooling from four to one. So the easiest thing to write for all these is our delta U. And for each of these, it's going to be a CV delta T. And the only thing that's going to be changing is the subscript on our T's. Now, looking at Q's, the biggest thing that we can do is use the, the word adiabatic in this process 1 to 2 and 3 to 4. So from 1 to 2, we know that there is no Q, there's no heat transfer, because our process is adiabatic. And the same is true from 3 to 4, which means that we can say that the work is just a negative CV delta T, or it's equal to CV T1 minus T2. And the same thing is true from 3 to 4. This is CV T3 minus T4. And the other big thing that we can use this diagram for is the constant volume. So we know that the work done is equal to PDV, which is just the area under each of these curves. Well, there's no area under a constant volume curve. So the work done for both 2 to 3 and 4 to 1 is going to be 0, which means that our heat transfer can be written just as what we have at delta U. So whenever we're trying to determine the efficiency of an engine, we're looking at the net work. And the net work here is going to be equal to the work done in 1 to 2 plus the work done in 3 to 4. So this is going to be CV T1 minus T2 plus CV T3 minus T4. Like I said before, we also care about the QN because that's the amount of energy that we're spending in order to make this engine work. And so that's just going to be this CV T3 minus T2 term. And our end result is the thermal efficiency. This tells us what percentage of the heat that we're getting out of our combustion is actually producing good work for us. And so this is just the division of the two above, the W net divided by QN. Now, in order to do useful math with these statements, we actually want to use the adiabatic relations that we discussed in a previous video. So we can use this compression ratio to figure out what our temperature ratios are. 
So the relationship that we discussed was T2 over T1 is equal to V2 over V1 to the negative gamma minus 1. And so we can change that to say that T2 is equal to the compression ratio, which is V1 over V2 to the gamma minus 1 power, right? So we're using that negative to switch this to V1 over V2 and then just calling that R. And likewise, because the volume ratio is the same between 1 and 2 and 4 and 3, we can say that T3 is equal to T4 times R to the gamma minus 1. So this should be T1 in there. So we're rewriting our adiabatic relationship to make links between the temperature at state 2 and the temperature at state 1, and then again, the temperature at state 3 and the temperature at state 4. So here's how this works with our equations up here. We're going to do Qn first just because it's a little bit simpler. But the end result here is that we have Cv multiplied by T4 times R to the gamma minus 1 minus T1 times R to the gamma minus 1. And then up above, we're going to end up with Cv times T1 minus T1 times R to the gamma minus 1 plus Cv times T4 times R to the gamma minus 1 minus T4. And so looking at our efficiency, we can write this term above this term. And we'll do a little bit of simplification as we do that. So we end up with Cv times T1 multiplied by 1 minus R to the gamma minus 1, and then minus Cv times T4 multiplied by the exact same ratio, 1 minus R to the gamma minus 1. And that's divided by Cv times T1 minus T4 with another negative multiplied by R to the gamma minus 1. So first off, we can get rid of these CVs. And then we can bring out this T1 minus T4 term. And so this ends up as T1 minus T4 multiplied by 1 minus r to the gamma minus 1 divided by a negative t1 minus t4 times r to the gamma minus 1, which means we can also get rid of the t1 minus t4 term. And so we can rewrite this again as the thermal efficiency is equal to an r to the gamma minus 1 minus 1 over r to the gamma minus 1. So that negative came up top and swapped the order of the numerator, and then we're just left with an r to the gamma minus 1 for the denominator. And that can be simplified again by saying this is 1 minus 1 over r to the gamma minus 1, or if we prefer, we can write this as 1 minus r to the negative gamma minus 1. And so it turns out that our Thermal efficiency for the auto cycle can be written as only a function of the compression ratio. So how far are we actually compressing this thing? And the ratio of specific heats, which is determined by whatever fluid we're using. And then if we know what the QN is, if we know what our heat added by the combustion is, we can just calculate the net work by taking this efficiency and multiplying it by Qn. That W net is just equal to Qn multiplied by our efficiency. So again, if we make this assumption of constant specific heats, we can very quickly find the efficiency from the compression ratio and that ratio of specific heats and the amount of work if we know how much heat was added by combustion. So this is the simplest way to look at the auto cycle. In any case, that's all for this video, and I will catch you next time.